Hello, hello. Welcome to the Content Creation Made Easy podcast. I'm your host, Jen Liddy. And if you are anything like me, you know that Instagram is a place that people go to find information for you. It's like one of the first places people often wind up going to search for you. Um, and you know it's important. And you you might even tell yourself like you should be there, but you feel overwhelmed by it. You feel frustrated by it. You just feel like you never know what you're doing. Well, then today's episode is 100,000% for you. I've invited <clears throat> Natasha Pierre on, and I invited Natasha on because I follow her on Instagram and I find her stuff to be relatable, realistic, and doable, which is, you know, basically my entire premise of why my business exists. If it's not going to be those things, why, those three things, why are we doing it? So I wanted to say, welcome to Natasha. I'm going to tell you a little teeny bit about her because you're going to find out way more about her as we go. So Natasha is, she has her own podcast and it's called Shine Online. So it's the Shine Online podcast. And she has a video, she is a video marketing coach. And she's all about helping small businesses through her educational content, through her signature group program. She's all about helping people build their brand confidently with a video marketing strategy. And I love that we're going to be specifically talking about Instagram and video today uh, to grow your business, grow your community, and also have an impact on your audience. So Natasha, thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I mean, you're like speaking my language on just content being easier. So I'm just so excited to, to chat. Yeah, I was really glad when you said yes to being on the podcast. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Like, how did you get into becoming an Instagram video coach, basically? Yes. Um, so I actually, it started back when I was in college. Um, I started doing some digital marketing and public relationship um, internships. And the first person I interned with, she had her own digital marketing business. She worked completely remote. And it was my first time kind of introduced to the entrepreneurship world. And so circle back, you know, a few years after that, uh, she really had kind of planted the seed. And before I was graduating, I was like, so what do I want to do when I graduate? What is that dream job going to be? And so I had the idea of doing social media management services and I told her about the idea. She was like, go for it. I'll actually give you your first client. And so that is kind of how it started. So I started just like on freelancing websites, doing social media management. And really quickly, I knew I needed to niche down because any social media manager knows that when you're doing social media management for all the platforms, it is quite literally a full-time job. And I just found that Instagram was what got me the most excited, but also was what businesses struggled the most to really leverage for their brands. And so that's kind of where my Instagram management services came about. And from doing courses and starting to build my personal brand that has now transformed into how I work with my clients now through coaching and my signature programs. You just sent an email recently about what social media managers know and need to know. And can we just talk for a minute, because some of the people listening to this podcast are their own social media managers, or they might have a virtual assistant who they've taught how to be a social media manager. Can we just take a minute and talk about like what it means to be a social media manager? And I think you said something important, like it's a full-time job, which is, I think, why people are so overwhelmed. So I'd love to hear your take on what it means to be a social media manager. Yes. When it comes to social media management, we're not only managing the strategy side of things of like, what is our goal and what are we creating to get closer to that goal? Um, but there also is the other side of it is actually creating the content, organizing the content, editing, uh, scheduling, everything like that. Um, so for every part of that process, I mean, you're like a copywriter and a designer and a video editor and everything in between. Um, but what's really interesting is even as someone who has been a social media manager, and I think for a lot of bigger businesses, like it's absolutely a necessity. Um, but what I often find is that people often outsource too much of their social media to VAs or social media management, or they think that hiring a social media manager is going to fix the problem. Um, but when, from my experience, when working with my own clients, it was like, pulling teeth to get them on video and get them showing up because you could have the best social media manager on your team, but we can never replace you as the founder of your business, as the person creating the products or facilitating the offers. We can never replace that. We can never be that. And so while I think that having a social media manager can be so helpful for just helping you be consistent, I actually think that we all have such a unique opportunity where we are 
are able to be the own creators for our brands. I mean, really big brands, they hire creators to create content for them. And, and we have all the tools we need to do that. So that's kind of my hot take is that, yes, I love social media managers and we can facilitate such a really important role. But I often find that we we can be our own social media manager with the right tools and tactics in place. And today we're going to talk about how to simplify the video creation piece. So a lot of what you said, there's a lot in what you just said. You talked about strategy, which I'm always talking about, like, why are you putting the thing out there? If you don't know why you're putting the thing out there, it's not going to lead you, your audience where you want them to go. That's a waste of your time. So if you're your own social media manager, you're doing everything from that strategy creation to then all the nuts and bolts of writing the copy, you know, putting it in, putting it in Canva, then putting it into a schedule or researching the hashtags. If that's what you're doing, like there's, that's, there's a lot of reasons why we're so tired. And so the other thing I think you said that's incredibly important is video. I'm not a huge fan of video and here's why. I hate talking to nobody because I'm an extrovert. And so it feels like I'm just opening the window and talking to nobody. But I do know, like I could do an interview like this and conversation like this all day long, but in an AI world where a lot of copy can be generated for us, the thing that really is important is for us to get on video as part of our social media strategy because it's a way to connect and be real. Uh, And I think that that's an an important nugget that you said, like it's that video piece. But when we have so much else going on, it's really hard to find the energy to get on video. Yes. And I totally get that. I, I mean, I don't have a social media manager. I don't have a lot of marketing help, so it could even take a lot of time and capacity for me as well. Um, Mm -hmm. but I think what the first thing I always have my clients do is yes, we talk about strategy. We talk about your goals, but I actually like them to do a strengths assessment because as you kind of already identified, you have a unique strength of really loving conversation and love connecting with community. And some people, might not like editing or filming content or some people might like have an idea and be really great at writing copy or there's so many different things that we're great at and I think we often sometimes use that as an excuse of like oh well then video is not for me but I actually think that there's so many types of video especially on a platform like Instagram that chances are we can find a way that does feel good for us um, which means when it feels good when it feels enjoyable um, then we're more likely to be able to do it consistently and it doesn't feel so draining. So that's always what I recommend people is don't do what doesn't feel good because at the end of the day, it's not going to be sustainable. It's like finding the right exercise or workout or yes. eating plan for yourself. You have, if, if you don't like it, you're never going to stick to it. Um, I, I know today we're going to talk about three ways to simplify your content. And so what we're kind of setting up here is the big problem. And the thing that I love about you is you break everything down to such a realistic approach to solve that problem. So let's move into what are the three ways to simplify your con- your video content. Sound good? Yes, let's do it. <laughs> okay. So I know that you've got the three things here. We're starting with the topics. So how, what do people struggle with when it comes to content topics and how can we make it easier? Yes. I think the biggest thing when it comes to content topics is we kind of just think of what we do and what we're an expert at. And we just grab for any ideas that we can without really having set topics that we're talking about on a regular basis. And this is where I love to recommend content pillars. And I know that everyone has a different approach to content pillars. Maybe you've tried content pillars and maybe it hasn't worked for you. Um, But what I found to be the most effective for so many different types of businesses is having five specific topics and categories. And some of this might be the ones that automatically come to your mind of, what you're an expert at, what you do in your business, what your industry or niche is. Um, I always like to have one of those be kind of more of a personal connection point. I always like to add the disclaimer. This doesn't mean you have to share all of your personal business and all of your personal life, but it is important to have a few things to just connect with your people, to humanize your brand. And that's one of those pillars that might only be on a platform like stories. Um, And then the other type of content I like to include in my content pillars 
is something that is related to what you do, but not directly what you do. Um, an example of this is one of my favorite cleaning brands, Blue Land. They do kind of eco-friendly cleaning supplies. And one of the things that I love that they incorporate into their content is, yes, they talk about how to use the cleaning supplies and cleaning hacks and all those types of things. But another thing that they share is essentially how to be more eco-friendly in your life, how to use less plastic or global warming and all those different things that they know their ideal person they're reaching is not just interested in how to clean and use less plastic in their daily routine, but they're interested in those deeper values. So kind of those related topics. And so once I find, once we have those five content pillars, we can go back to those pillars on a consistent basis. And those will help you not only generate content ideas, ideas, but also vet any random ideas that come up when you're brainstorming or in your daily routine. So you can make sure that you're always intentionally creating. So it's like, um, people who are entrepreneurial are super creative. And yes. so they're always finding new problems. They're always finding new holes in the market. So it's kind of like they get that shiny object syndrome. So what you just said is basically like set your content pillars or your buckets or your topics, whatever you want to call them, and then return to them. Yes. Is that got it right? So what are your content pillars? Yes. Oh, I love that question. Um, so the first one is video marketing for small businesses. So specifically, what are the strategies needed to actually grow a business? I don't do creators, not influencers, specifically small businesses. Um, another one is actually video content creation. So as you can see, those are the obvious ones that come up and you could probably think are, are they the same thing, but one is really covering strategy and one is covering more of like the act actionable things that we're doing. Um, another one is authority building. So this one kind of relates back to one of my offers. And this is really how to be a thought leader and how to incorporate things like brand partnerships or speaking, um, and essentially growing and scaling your business. Uh, my fourth content pillar is kind of behind the scenes in my own business. So this is kind of one of my ways that I connect with my audience and I share kind of behind the scenes of what I'm working on, what's working in my strategy, what new things I'm trying and just how I run my own business. And then my last pillar is entrepreneur wellness. So this is where I'll share things like my morning routine and rituals, my daily matcha. This also is where I'll share things like mental health and wellness and being in the social media space. Um, so those are kind of my content pillars. And as you can see, it kind of creates a very well-rounded brand. If I only talked about video marketing and video content creation, I really would only be scratching the surface of my brand, which I think is where the idea of just having a niche, like niche down and have one thing. I think that's where that can actually harm our strategies. So that's kind of inside of my own pillars. I want people listening to hear that you did not say anywhere in there that I bring people like into the gynecologist's office with me that I no. like have this <laughs> huge, like, like, you know, you don't have, you have a private life still. You don't have to put, you don't have to bleed all over the internet in order to have uh, share a little bit of yourself. And in your last pillar, that's where you really get to do that in the behind the scenes. Right. And, and then yes. the wellness piece, like those are the, those are the two pillars where you can really show shine with yes. your, with your uh, private personal stuff. Yes, exactly. And I think it's really important to have those personal boundaries because that also yes. is not sustainable to share your what you're doing on your weekend and showing your family and, and all those different types of things. Everyone has different comfort levels, but for the most of us, we have to set some type of boundary. Um, and for that personal pillar, something that we love to call it as inside my program is we call it like your personal potpourri. And I feel like that makes it really fun because it means that it can and should evolve just like any of your pillars. It can and should evolve as your interests evolved. So like I recently, like recently, literally this weekend, I just got a walking <laughs> pad. And so that's a part of my it's entrepreneur. A walking pad. Like a, it's like a treadmill that goes under my, my desk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Wait, so are you sitting in your your? Like, no, I'm walking. Like whenever, you're, you're not standing. right now. Okay. Yeah, not right now. But um, when sometimes I'm working, well, I literally just got it, so I'm still testing it out. And so that's something I'm kind of sharing <laughs> in my stories, and, and like people were so interested in it, and that kind of relates to entrepreneur wellness. And I love sure. to go on walks and take care of myself. And so that's something that I didn't talk about before, but it's something that relates yeah. back to that like personal pillar. So I think it makes it something fun that you can kind of change and experiment with as you grow and change as a person. Today I was listening to a creator um, who's a friend of mine and she recently had some surgery and she was saying, uh, you know, she wasn't, she wasn't telling people what, what kind of surgery she had had. And I could tell in the energy behind what she was saying was there was almost like an apology about not telling people. Mm. And she mostly was saying like, it's just that, you know, it's not a big deal and you don't need to worry about it. And then finally somebody commented like, you don't have to share yeah. everything with your people. And I, and I could tell that that was like a relief for her to hear. And I think that's an important thing when you're establishing your topics or your pillars. Yes, there needs to be a little bit of you in there, but it doesn't need to be, you know, everything. Yes. And to your point, when we set those boundaries with our community, they're always going to respect them. But I often find I think a lot of like influencers, like lifestyle influencers are kind of navigating this space currently, but um, mm -hmm. there isn't really a landscape of do I show my kids online and do I share everything that I'm doing? And I think that um, they're kind of the first to pave that way. But overall, what I've seen so many of them say is that like, I'm tired of creating and, and they eventually get to this place of burnout, but then their community is like, well, I want to see more of this. And I want to see more of that because once you kind of take the, the shackles off and there really are no boundaries, then people don't have boundaries with you as well. So, so I think it's really yeah, important so to kind of like set the expectation of like how we want our communities to interact with us and what we are willing to share and what we're not. And I think that if somebody's listening to this and they've, they're like a little uncomfortable with how far the boundaries have been pushed or what they've exposed already or let people into, you can immediately take that back. Like you yes. don't, there's the only person creating the expectation is you at this point. Yes, so I'm absolutely. really glad we're having this conversation. So when it comes to topics, making video creation easier, having those pillars, you, you suggest up to five. Um, what are some of the things that people bump up against when it comes to creating their five pillars? Oh, I think the biggest thing I see is people take types of content and they think they're content pillars. And this is because a lot of people um, approach content pillars this way and, and to each their own, everyone has a different approach. But what I often see is people say like work with me Monday or tip Tuesday or education or entertainment or inspiration. Like these are all types of content and, yes. and the goals of your content. Um, but they will be very hard to consistently brainstorm content around. Um, it's also not strategic. Absolutely. It's just like a wellness Wednesday doesn't get you into my program that I'm launching in two weeks, right? No. And even if you did wellness programs, it still wouldn't be effective. It can be the way you create your content pillars, but it shouldn't be your content pillars. And another thing is you, you heard in my content pillars that none of them were my offer name group program, mastermind, VIP days, um, your pillars should support at least one or more of your offers. So like I said, I had an authority building one and that's what my mastermind is all about. So mm -hmm. you should be able to have pillars that support you launching and selling your offers. Of course, that's what makes them strategic. But I often find that people literally, especially if they have like products or services, they're like branding design package is the pillar. And I'm like, that's not really the pillar, but we're very, very close. So yeah. those are the biggest mistakes that I see with pillars. <laughs> One of the things my clients struggle with is they just have a bajillion ideas. Yes. So it really is hard for them. They feel that the, the content pillars can be a little rigid, like, oh, I don't want to be saying the same things all the time. And my clients, I'm curious if your clients do this too, they it, I always say you have to manage your own mind because you're going to get bored with your content before your audience will get bored with your content. So yes. like returning to those five content pillars can feel boring for a really dynamic creator. Yeah, absolutely. And I think with, I think with those types of people, when you find that you have so many things you want to talk about, I think the biggest thing is like, really just think about like, what is your goal with what you're doing? And if all those exciting things don't lead to that goal, I think it'll probably give you a little bit of the permission slip of like, 
okay, then yeah, maybe this doesn't really serve a purpose or maybe it's something fun that I can share on stories. It doesn't need to be in all of my content. But I also will say if those type of people struggle with like nailing down the five, I actually find that they like reversing the process of creating their content pillars. Mm -hmm. So just like brainstorm all the ideas and then start to categorize them. them. And you'll start to see the common threads of like, these are all the subtopics within that overarching topic. So I think that kind of allows you to have all those ideas and be creative and still have a little bit of fun, but know that you want to have those kind of little, little pillars to help you guide yourself. So you're really spending your time and energy wisely. So so that's such a great way to reverse engineer it for those people who are like idea machines. (laughs) Yes. All right. Let's move on to another way to make simplify, to to simplify video content, which is um, actually the production piece of it. I cannot wait to hear what you have to say about this because part of why I railed so hard against video, especially when it was like really coming into play in TikTok in 2020, while I was sitting on my hammock, like consuming hours of TikTok. So much that the TikTok guy would come on and be like, you've been on here a long time. Go get something to eat. Um, was I enjoyed consuming it, but like the idea of a production that included scripts and characters and and costumes and music, yeah. I was like I just couldn't. I just yes. and I still can't, frankly. <laughs> I can't wait to talk to hear what you have to say about production. Yes. So what I often find is production is where people create obstacles for showing up on video. Um, and I'm not calling you out, Jen. I'm not calling you out because I have been there. I'm the, I'm the person to want to like do the fanciest video. But there's two reasons why I want to encourage people. And I get this from my clients all the time. They're like, how did you do this fancy thing on your story? And I'm like, I'm I'm not going to tell you because you don't need to do it kind of thing. Oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah, that and I feel so like it's really empowering. I'm like, you don't need to have the fancy transition or you don't need to do an overly produced piece of content if that is an obstacle. If it's something that lights you up and gets you creative, which is honestly like people think I'm absolutely insane. Editing is my favorite part of the video you process. <laughs> You are a unicorn, I have to say. You Which I know unicorn. is not most people. Um, and so I think it's really important to understand, we already talked about those strengths. So what are the yeah. weaknesses that we want to mm-hmm. avoid? If it's mm-hmm. editing, if it's talking, if any of those things are holding you back and, and really draining from you and being an obstacle, it's one of those things, again, you won't be able to s- consistently be on video. So yeah. make it as easy as possible to create video content. I'm going to kind of give a few ideas on how people could do that. The first is your actual setup is what I often find is that people are either using the most complex lighting and tripods and stuff that they don't need, but just think about what type of video content do I want to create and how can I make that easier for me? So maybe it's having a corner in your, in your house that you love how it looks. And so that's always going to be the place you sit down and do your videos. Or for me, I always have my phone stand right on my desk. So literally not only am I seeing it every day, but when I'm doing podcast interviews or coaching my clients or just working behind the scenes, I literally just put my phone up and then I'm creating video content. Mm -hmm. Um, Or if you do have a tripod and let's say you're you're working with your product or you want to take it around with you, choose something that's sturdy and easy to bring around and maybe just keep it up in a corner of your office. So you're a lot more likely to grab for it. Um, So I really feel like tools can be really helpful for us. And it kind of gives us a little bit of a buy-in of like, okay, I'm doing this video thing. Like I I bought the $20 Amazon tripod, but what it really does is it makes it easier. So we're not like, well, do I like hold my phone or do I like put my phone here? And it just kind of like, it makes it feel so much more frustrating than it needs to be. Um, Another tip that's one of my favorites and I actually use it all the time is actually using your non-video content to turn it into videos. So I know we already talked about like content pillars and ideation, but if you're just like, I just need to like start creating video content and get that habit rolling. Cause at the end of the day, that's simply what it is. And you kind of need to practice and tweak for it to become easier is take captions or carousel copy 
or emails or blog posts or podcasts, podcast scripts, take those and turn those into video outlines or turn those into one of my favorite types of easy types of content. You could literally just create these um, quote videos, which is exactly how it sounds. Take some simple footage of, like I said, you working in your business, you walking into your office, coaching, whatever you do in your business, that footage you're already capturing and literally just add text on top. And it could be uh, a perspective shift. It could be a new way of doing something. It could be a hot take. It could be how to do something. It could be a tip. Um, Whatever that content is that you're repurposing, probably just from doing that alone, I'm going to give that like as homework for everyone listening, you will probably (laughs) be able to get like weeks worth of content, but you're also getting the like value of video. Um, So I find that those are just a few ways to kind of get you started with simplifying your video content. But I find that when we don't feel like we need to overly produce and edit and use the fanciest tools and we have to be Mm -hmm. all done up and things like that. When we kind of take away those obstacles, we allow ourselves to show up more in our video content. You said something, um, in our, in, in our back and forth setting this up was ignore the pressure to always be groundbreaking. Yes. And that I think that comes into play, not only when you're choosing your topics, your, and your content pillars, but also the production value. You don't need to, you know, go over the top and the, the under complicating goes along with, you don't have to be groundbreaking. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think we all feel like we need to always reinvent the wheel and always be creating something new and it has to be shinier or more interesting (laughs) or whatever it is compared to someone else in your industry. Um, but really at the end of the day, when we actually kind of pull the reins back and we simplify the content we're creating and it doesn't need to have 10 hacks and it's just one really great insight, we're actually serving our audience better because they're not overwhelmed consuming. Mm -hmm. They are able to actually get the message and like see that little transformation or shift or win as they're watching your video. So I feel like we think by doing more, we're actually doing better, but it's kind of the opposite. Yeah. I call it the difference between fire hosing and fish food. Like Mm. you can't drink from a fire hose. And if you give people a little bit of fish food, they take what they need and they go back to the, to the point where I really feel like I need to change the name of my tagline to like do less content, have more impact. Like that's really what you and I are talking about here. Uh, one last thing on the idea of production. I think this is a stumbling block for a lot of people. I'm curious to hear what your clients do with this. Do people think they need to be full makeup, got their hair done, Mm -hmm. got an outfit on, uh, have the most perfect background? My VAs and I were just talking the other day and they're like, can you do some video in your car? Because people seem to really like videos in in cars. (laughs) Yes. Like I'm always, really, they always have a sweatshirt on. (laughs) My car. Yes, it is a thing. This kind of concept of casual content. So the first thing is to identify why we feel the need to be done up on camera. And what I often find that it it kind of boils down to, we think to be professional, to be taken seriously, for people to buy our stuff, we have to be done up. We have to be in the best corner. We have to have all those things. And while I think that we can incorporate those things if that feels good for you. Like if you love getting ready to film your content and that's a ritual that makes you feel confident, I say go for it. If it's wearing your favorite color, I obviously love my yellow office. So you that's do something. Love yellow. <laughs> yes. I love my yellow office. I love seeing that in the backgrounds of my videos. So with those types of things, if they're helpful, I say go for it. Um, everyone has different comfort levels, but I really think that it's rewriting what does showing up on video even mean mean. And for the most part, someone's watching your video looking exactly how you're creating it, right? And it makes it relatable. It's human. We all work from home. We're in our cars, whatever it is. Um, So at the end of the day, I think as long as the quality of the video, and when I mean quality, I mean that it like we can actually hear you, that it's not blurry, that yes, the content as well of what you're talking about and what you're sharing, as long as that is good, I say you can show up however you'd like to. And that's definitely how I show up as well. Um, So yeah, I definitely don't think it's necessary. And I in fact think like doing the opposite can be just as impactful for just connecting with your audience. They're real people too. They're they're watching you from their bed. Yes, exactly. Um, 
So the third thing that we want to talk about to simplify video content is your actual footage. And you've got some really great tactical stuff here. I'd love to hear it. Yes. When it comes to your footage, the thing that has like completely changed my life is stock content. It's something that I will not shut up on <laughs> about yeah, on my Instagram content. anywhere. Yep. Stock content. And at the end of the day, it's B-roll, which essentially is just mm -hmm. video clips and supplemental footage. Um, and what I find is so, so helpful is I try to stockpile this type of stock content. So when I want to create that quote video that I mentioned, or I want to put together like a storytelling video or whatever type of content I create or even using it on stories, I already have the footage. And I've gotten in the habit to doing this where like if I created like no new footage today, it probably would get me through like most of this year. So once you kind of enact that habit of, okay, I'm walking into my office, I'm doing those things in my routine. I like to call that just like content stacking, which essentially is habit stacking if anyone's like a productivity nerd mm -hmm. like myself which essentially is just like, what are the things you're already doing and just capture it for video footage? Yeah. And I can just hit record. Yes. Just hit record. And I think that goes back to my other tip of have the tripod up, have the yes. phone stand up so you can just press record and it's really easy. But once you get into the habit of doing that on your daily routine, you also can do it in a way of batching. So mm -hmm. I also love doing this with a content day. So essentially I set aside a part of a day. I put together a little shot list of, oh, I want some video clips of me creating content and me walking in my office and me with my matcha and me coaching. So I kind of put together just some shots that I want to capture. And maybe this is where if you want to be in your favorite um, space, maybe you want to go to a coffee shop and do it with a friend or go to a park or the beach or whatever it is. But like, make it a fun kind of like experience. And then just get a bunch of video footage, like just get mm -hmm. as much as you can, because that will get you through months, quarters, half of a year worth of content. So really focusing on multi-use video footage has really changed how I think about creating video content is that I can show up on stories or I can create reels or I can create footage that goes across all the different platforms I'm creating on, but I, I'm literally just doing it with stuff that I'm already doing or I, and I can batch in in advance. So that's been kind yeah. of like my favorite thing ever lately. There's no double dipping here. Like, I mean, you are, I'm sorry, you are actually double yes. dipping. Double dipping is a good thing here. And you're, I just want to be clear for people listening. It's not like you're talking, you're not a talking head to the, the phone at this point. Like you're just having like it record Yes, and then the music or even a voice overlay would yep. go over it. So it's not like you have to be talking to your phone while you're just getting this B-roll footage. Exactly. I Beautiful. love, I think there's a lot of value in talking videos in your strategy, but it, it literally takes energy to talk. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it does. I find and to that look at the phone. Yes, absolutely. And I think with using your stock content, you can have a voiceover where you're sharing your thoughts or talking about the tip or insight, or you can have text and then be able to leverage trending audios without having to like create a trend that you're going to post once and never be able to post again. Um, yeah. So yes, it's it's pretty much very easy, minimal setup, and you also really only need to know basic edits, like know how to like <laughs> upload a. Clip clip, film a clip and add text to it and you're, and you're good to go. I love it. I think that you've given us so much great information and insights and also mindset shifts, right? It's not just about the knowing how to do it. It's about clearing out the garbage so you can do it. So I just want to say thank you, Natasha. This has been, I think, you, well, you speak my language, so I really love that. Um, but I really think it's tactical and, and super doable for people. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing it. How can people get into your world? Oh, yes. Thank you so much for having me. Um, if you want to connect with me, Instagram's definitely one of the best places at Shine with <laughs> Natasha. And you also can find me on TikTok and YouTube at Shine with Natasha. Um, and then definitely tune into the Shine Online podcast. I actually have an entire episode on how I structure my content days. So if that concept appealed to you, I feel like that'd be a great place to start binging. Yeah, I, I think if you are really interested, if you're a listener who's really interested in diving specifically into Instagram, following Natasha and listening to her podcast will help you because like we just, we just touched the tip of the iceberg today with just like simplifying video content. There's so much more about Instagram that you can harness to use to your benefit. So go follow Natasha. Um, did you say your website yet? 
Yes, Shine with Natasha as well. Shinewithnatasha.com for my website if you want to scroll around, check out my freebies, my programs, and everything in between. Everything's there. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you. Um, For you, the listener, I would love to know what is something that you could take away from this? What's one thing that you can, like, just one nugget that you can implement this week? It doesn't have to be everything. It could just be one thing. Even if it was just, like, I don't have to put makeup on to get on video. I'd love to know what your one sh- one shift is. You can leave us a comment on the podcast, and I will link to all of your links in the show notes, Natasha. Thank you so much for listening, and Natasha, thank you so much for showing up. Thank you. Bye, everyone.